I thought, boy, maybe we had it a little bit too early. Maybe it's going to take a little while for some of them to get there. But I'm super, super pleased that we've had this many come. We hope that you were spiritually fed last night. And those you don't see here, and give them a call and see if they can come. We'll now turn the time over to Brother Anders. It's a thrill to be with you again this morning and to feel the spirit that you bring here. I'm going to follow the pattern that the Nephite prophets followed in the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> Jacob, for example, this is a case in point. He had just two beautiful chapters on Isaiah, and uh, they deal with the prophetic picture of the latter days. <clears throat> 2 Nephi chapter 7 and 8, and then he opens up in chapter 9 in one of the most beautiful discourses on Christ, with the indication that Christ now is the center of it all, and uh, the whole thing centers in him. The gospel certainly is centered in him and named after him, though it's the Father's plan. The temple is the temple of the Lord. Every symbol in the temple is symbolic of Christ. And the whole thing, then, is symbolic of that divine order that centers in him. The sacred historical portrayals recount the great vision of Christ, his kingdom of Mount Zion. And uh, the temple robes are symbolic. Every feature of them is symbolic. And if you knew the symbolism of the temple ordinance, the temple robe, you would know more by far than I'd be there, there to teach. It's just beautiful, and that's why it's so important and necessary to, to see things in the central focus on Christ and of his atonement. And so having said something about the holy order through the ages and the emphasis of the, the prograde price on it, the whole Antediluvian period being founded on that sacred eternal program and and Abraham's life being founded on it, and and uh, the prophet Joseph's great vision and effort to get us fully grounded in it and established in it in this dispensation, so that there can truly be a restitution of all things. See, now having <clears throat> done a few things in that sense last night, I'd like to uh, turn to the subject now of knowing God through the Pearl Great Prize. And to begin with, uh, Holy Christ contains accounts of God's revelations to man through most of the major dispensations of the gospel. To Adam, to Enoch, to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, to Jesus, and to Joseph Smith. It's an interesting volume of scripture in that sense, that it gives us the panoramic view in, in many things. Uh, we have, for example, the the account of the first vision, and uh, this was not only momentous in the sense of opening the greatest of all God's dispensations on this earth, and if I may add, all the dispensations on all of these earths. It was momentous in that sense. This is the great redemptive earth, and the dispensation of the fullness of times is the redemptive dispensation, and we're a part of it. And the order of things in relation to God's work is that the last shall be first, as he says in section 29. He says, The first shall be last, and the last shall be first in all things whatsoever I have created by the word of my power. And so in the great councils of heaven, God ordained Joseph to be first, next to Christ. And then he ordained that the dispensation would become last because it's consummation in its character. And then he ordained that if we do the work of this dispensation and fulfill the program of this dispensation, in the final analysis, things will come back. The last will be first again. And that's the order of things. See, that's uh, on, on an occasion when, when the apostles asked uh, Jesus, uh, Hey, we've been through a lot of trials and tribulations for you. <clears throat> now, what are we going to get out of this? And I don't know that they had self-interest at, at heart. Maybe the human nature has a little of that in it. But uh, there's some genuine reason there. 
Peter said, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? <clears throat> and then the Savior explains. He says, uh, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve, tri uh, twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, that's why the three chief apostles play a predominant role in the Holy Endowment. This is Matthew 19, beginning with verse 27. And then he tells the basis of judgment, the basis of rewards, if I can put it that way. He says, And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Now, he didn't say every faithful person is going to be exalted to be an apostle, or a president of the stake, or a high council in eternity. He's not talking about that, because the eternal order is the family order, and uh, there's more to it than the nuclear family. Seriously, Abraham teaches us that. He's the father of the faithful. He's the father of all who are born again. And Joseph used to say to the brethren in this dispensation, Am I your father? And the answer was, Yes, you're our father. See, there's, there's, there's a program that, 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 in, that embraces and, and sanctifies and builds upon the nuclear family, the individual family. But it extends in Christ beyond that. And so he says, Then every one that's forsaken father and mother and so forth shall have a hundredfold. And then he added this, But many that are first shall be last, and the last, and put Joseph Smith in there in the dispensation of the forms of times, and the last shall be first. You see that? And so the, the Lord works that way. The Lord works on the basis of the first should be last and the last first. And he brings things around finally to establish his ultimate purpose. And uh, in that sense, when the Lord organized things in preparation for this for mortality, if he just uh, started at the top and says, let's have all the, the great ones come first, uh, there wouldn't be any valiancy then to establish the millennial reign, <laughs> and that's the consummation program, and, his, and to establish the Zion of the last day, see. And so while he made selection of great personalities to have dispensations and great people to be part of dispensations, then uh, he reserved uh, uh, many, many of the leading generals for Joseph Smith's day, and then there is a future day that we are standing on the very threshold of, spoken of in scriptures when he will set his hand again the second time, and there are many generals that he has reserved there, and this time, this time Zion is going to be built. It will be built by judgment, as Isaiah says, Zion shall be redeemed by judgment under Congress with righteousness. See? But we begin then with Joseph Smith and that great first vision. A great first vision then opened this, the greatest of all dispensations of time. And as the prophet then experienced that, uh, that vision, then great clarifications were made to him concerning the nature of deity. He beheld, first of all, that, uh, that there's two beings, the Father and the Son, and that's so diametrically opposed to the great Nicene Creed, which is the most sophisticated, godly duke that the human mind has ever contrived. Uh, utter nonsense, utter ridiculousness. Uh, and it set forth then in clarity, it set forth in clarity then uh, the, uh, the singular nature of the Father and of the Son. And uh, in addition to that, it taught us very clearly that God is more than physical. We want to get into that and talk about that a little bit and, and how and, and why that's true and how that's important to know and to understand. But as the prophet said, as he, as he experienced that great theophany, uh, wrote out it, he says, I saw a light then above the brightness of the sun, and it descended gradually until it rested upon me. I like Wilson Pratt's clarification on that in the publication of the first vision that he made. Orson lived with the prophet quite a few times when he was in from his missions, 
and became intimate with him in many ways. And as he gives his account of the first vision, he talks about the brilliant light that Joseph saw in the heavens that descended gradually. And I went to hit the treetops, and this is springtime, and the leaves were just coming out. The prophet, uh, he says, uh, was wondering, hey, I'm right in the line of fire. <laughs> and that's pretty bright, and I don't know. I don't know about this situation. And but he says when the light rested on the treetops and he saw that it didn't burn them, then in the prophet's mind, which I'm sure was racing 100 miles an hour, he, uh, he concluded that if it didn't burn the trees, maybe he had hope. <coughs> And he exerted faith on that premise and on that possibility, see. And then the light rested upon him, and he saw these two glorious personages in brightness and glory above the brightness of the sun. And uh, here then, not only did he see the separate and distinct nature of the Father and the Son, but he saw what the scriptures call the divine nature. And we need to focus on the divine nature. It's the key. It's not only the key to the understanding of God, it's the key to the understanding of man, and it's the key to the understanding of the gospel. If there's any one thing that will open more doors of insight and understanding, it's to understand the divine nature. Section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants is classic, a classic statement on that. And if you haven't memorized section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants, read it enough to where at least you can almost recite it uh, from memory, then you haven't studied it enough. You need to get back to it, see. But it deals with the divine nature and the glory of God, which is intelligence. And that doesn't mean that he just takes uh, glory by having a book under his arm and walking across BYU campus. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that that brilliance of light, which is above the light of the sun, which literally eclipses the light of the sun, and from the book of Moses we know that the rheostat was turned down. The Lord tells us in the book of Moses that no man can behold all of his glory and afterwards remain in the flesh on the earth. Now, Joseph remained in the flesh on the earth, so the rheostat was turned down. And yet that was above the bright in the sun. But that concentration of light isn't just a brilliant light. It's intelligence. And intelligence consists then of truth as its basic ingredient. And then truth shines, as the Doctrine of Covenant says, which truth shines. And the light then, the light of truth then, is the light which Joseph Smith saw. And that light is made up of the attributes and of the love of God and of the truth of God, and of his divine mercy, and of his divine justice. It's the composite of all of those together. So that when, for example, Nephi, having been in the presence of God, uh, talked about being consumed by the love of God and the consuming of my flesh, uh, just a, a literal uh, enlightenment of the individual, to where you just literally alive every cell of your body, is literally alive with truth and light and intelligence and with power. And it's a living thing. It's literally a living thing. And the prophet beheld that. And he knew then of the character of God. He knew of the separate nature. He knew of the physical traits and characteristics. And he knew above all then of the divine nature. And and that's the thing, then, that, that, that he came away from the, from, from the sacred grove with. He came away, then, with, with, with that kind of knowledge. And it was so, so uh, much of an impact upon him that it literally then melted him down from within, found himself laying on his back when he got through. And after a while, then, he could finally get enough strength to walk home and lean up against the hearth. And his mother asked him what's wrong, then he... So well, I learned that Presbyterianism isn't really uh, the true church. You see that? But that's that's the thing that he had. See, and, and that's the that's the great vision that opened uh, this dispensation. And then he later makes clarifications on it. Uh, the Articles of Faith, which is a part of the Pearl of Great Price, we believe in God, the Eternal Father, in His Son Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. 
And then the prophet makes a clarification here of a basic nature in section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where uh, just briefly, but with uh, great and significant uh, insight, and he says this beginning with verse uh, uh, 22. He says, The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. Now, he didn't say it's like man's, but it's as tangible as man's. And uh, don't put the word like in there, because it's not like man's. Okay? He says, The Son also, but the Holy Ghost has a body of flesh and bone, has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. Now, spirit is that purifying substance out of which our bodies were organized. And there's different kinds of spirit, if I can put it that way. When I went to school and studied a little of the physical world, they used to say there were 92 elements. Now, we know that there's a lot more than that now. It's up into, what, 102 or 3 or something like that. See, that we know. But in the realm of spirit, <clears throat> there is that kind of diversity also, and probably more so. Uh, sunlight is spirit. When I picked that up from the Doctrine and Covenants years ago, that, that was a tremendous revelation to me. I had kind of had the idea that, that, that God in heaven was off somewhere way out there, and they're just so in such a different realm. And then when I really got into section 90, uh, 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants and found that the light of the sun is, is, is the glory of God. Uh, and there's a great light spectrum, running from there clear on over up, up that way. I'll put it that way, see? And down here on the lesser level, it's this three-dimensional stuff that we call sunlight that kicks along 186,000 miles a second, see? And then on up through, as you've gone up into celestial life, then there's a refinement and the purification of it. And it is light, but the, but the spectrum way up there is quite different than down here, see? But sunlight is what... Uh, Paul of Pat calls the, the Holy Spirit in its gross, grosser manifestations, or uh, as Charles W. Penrose said, in its less refined existence. That's the term he used, you see. When I, when I came to understanding that, that sunlight is a part of the glory of God, the prophet Joseph Smith, by the way, said that, that all light and heat are the glory of God, which is his power. That's a direct quote from him. All light and heat are the glory of God. I began to see things in that sense then, and then get them oriented in my mind clearly enough so I could, in some measure, infinitesimal way, begin to comprehend it. It opened doors of insight of great nature. Just think what happens when spring rolls around, and when the earth shifts on its axis, and, and we get a little more of that direct light, and the effect it has on, on the plant kingdom. And how balmy and warm and radiant it feels when you kind of uh, sit out in the sun, get out on the beach or something like this, see. Now, that's the less refined stuff. And when you move on up through there, then you move into the light of instinct that quickens the animal kingdom. You move on to the light of the natural man by which we live and move and have our being. And then you have to have the ordinances of the gospel, and you have to have the, the principle of faith put in there so that you begin to reach up and you have to have the channels open so that when you reach, the channels are open and you can, you can get on up into the higher realms of things, see? And then you get into the power of the Holy Ghost and into the baptism of fire and you get in, into uh, the higher program of the gospel which requires temple ordinances. And you finally can get the endowment of glory with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night over every dwelling place. And that's only a beginning, see? That's only a beginning. We shut off here? Uh, it moves on up, and as, as the kingdom is built, and as uh, the saints then comply and bring their lives more fully into harmony uh, with the gospel plan, and things are finally brought in to the throne, then, then you intensify that glory. And that's why the prophet Joseph taught, for example, that, that uh, uh, the great priesthood figures of this earth, like our father Adam, can't get a fullness of glory until all things have been brought to, into proper alignment with the Lord. That's why, for example, when that great council of Adam on Diamond is held, uh, 
and all things are aligned. The great judgment of priesthood authorities from beginning down to the end takes place, and, and where uh, the dispensation of the fullness of times is finally brought up into being, and all dispensations are gathered into this one dispensation. And all heads of past dispensations are sealed to the prophet Joseph Smith so that the last becomes first, see? And they're all part of this in order to become part of the great consummating program. Then the glory and power that's made manifest will be marvelous. And it will, and it will be a basis then for, for the, the millennial period when the earth is renewed to its paradisiacal glory. And then when you finally bring the Jews in and bring Jerusalem in and establish the two centers of power, then, then you'll have the divine nature fill the earth uh, and the knowledge of God, which is revelatory, not just theological. The knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. Eh? And uh, all the plant kingdom will be quickened and animated by this living li power of love and of union. And the animal kingdom will be quickened. And Isaiah's statement, the lamb will lie down with the lion. And that the child will place his hand in the hold of the cockatrice and will be literally fulfilled. It will be a literal thing. It's not just the fantasy of some old prophet who's wondering about peace and righteousness like, like the world says. And it'll be that kind of thing. Now, that's the thing we're dealing with, my brothers and sisters. And that's the thing that was open to Joseph Smith in the first vision. That's the thing that we're dealing with in, in respect to the gospel. And that's the thing then that we need to know and understand as we, as we talk about uh, deity and our relationship to deity. Now, as the prophet said, the Father has a body, flesh and bones, the Son also, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost is a personage of spirit, and uh, he adds, were it not so, he could not dwell in us. Now, there are times when the Holy Ghost as a person has to dwell within an individual, and that's one main reason why he doesn't have a body. He has to play that function. My personal feeling is that the first vision was one such time, so that in the first vision all three members of the Godhead were present. I believe my own personal feeling is that that, that, is, that was true. But there are times when the Holy Ghost has to dwell in a person. A person can have a, a devil dwell within him, and uh, many do, and even many good saints are plagued in sophisticated ways by personal beings representing the adversary beyond the veil. Uh, the prophet Joseph Smith once was talking about John E. Page, who was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, and uh, a very capable and gifted person. He went on a mission into New England and came back with three or four hundred converts and brought them to Zion a masterful teacher in his ability to, to handle words and to express himself. And uh, yet he had uh, uh, some flaws in his character. And the prophet added to that, he says, Brother Page has a very subtle devil to operate and to cope with. And the only way that he can handle him is by faith and by humility. And the sad thing is he didn't pay the price, and he's not longer listed among the members of the Twelve of this dispensation, see. But uh, we need to realize that there's, there's, a, there's a close liaison there far more than I ever dreamed used to be, or I used to dream it would be, but it's true. And uh, uh, where does the devil have his headquarters on this earth? The answer is Salt Lake City. And he's got a main branch at BYU. He's got another one back in Washington. Now, where would he have him if you knew uh, things like he knows things? Eh? That's where he has things. Eh? And he's operating, and he's operating among us as a people. And he's operating in an, I hate to use the word intelligible, but he's operating in a knowledgeable way against individuals. The devil doesn't know who you are when you're born. <clears throat> He wasn't in the council of heaven. He bolded the program before before things started, and uh, uh, he wasn't there in the grand organizational council after the war in heaven was all over, and he'd been cast out. And the book of Peregrine Christ tells us he knows not the plan of God, but he did know a lot of us very intimately, very intimately, 
your traits, your characteristics, your features. And he's a good fact-finding program, and he works on things see, in that sense. And uh, in various ways, and he finally comes to identify who's, who's who and who people are. And, uh, and then uh, they go to work very sophisticatedly, like they would do in, in uh, some education program, and they'll learn at universities and said, well, now, who can best handle this person? Who's got the in with him? Who's got the subtle approach to him, see? And they work in that way. I don't know how I got off on that subject, but, but, uh, uh, but that's part of the ball game, see? That's part of the ball game of being proved. And to cope with that, then, we've got to learn of Christ. We've got to have the humility that's necessary to truly just submit our will to Christ. It's not enough to follow Christ. You've got to give yourself to him, and you've got to be in him by your eye being single to his glory, and he's got to be in you by the powers of his Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that a little later more fully. But it isn't just a matter of following him and emulating him. It's a matter, actually, of surrendering will. That's the only thing that you've really got that's your own. And you need to surrender will to him and then grow up in Christ with the kind of trust that is necessary to partake of his truth and his light and his love and be perfected in him. There are no great free enterprisers in the celestial kingdom who did it on their own and who are just glorified on their own. That's not the, that's not the ball game. They are glorified in Christ. They are justified in Christ, sanctified in Christ, perfected in Christ, and glorified in Christ. And you grow up in Christ, and it's that kind of a relationship. Now, to understand that, you've got to know the divine nature. You can't understand that relationship, and you can't understand even the divine nature theologically. You've got to experience it. You've got to, you've got to understand it enough so that you say, I want to experience that. And then you've got to commit your life to the extent that you begin to get the Spirit of the Lord there. And you begin to feel the flow. And you live in the flow. So that it's living water springing up into everlasting life, see. It's that kind of a program. Now, let's talk, for example, about the corporeal nature of God for a minute. The prophet Joseph Smith here in uh, the teachings, and I'm reading from page 343, and this is the great uh, King Follett address where he's uh, speaking concerning man and his relationship to deity. 343 and 4, he says, for example, I want to ask this congregation, every man and child, to answer the question in their own heart, what kind of a being God is? Ask yourselves, turn your thoughts into your hearts, and say if any of you have seen, heard, or communed with him. This is a question that may occupy your attention for a long time. I again repeat the question, what kind of a being is God? Does any man or woman know? Have any of you seen him, heard him, or communed with him? Here is the question that will peradventure from this time henceforth occupy your attention. The scriptures inform us that, uh, quote, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. If any man does not know God and inquire what kind of being he is, if he will search diligently his own heart, uh, if the declaration of Jesus and the apostles will be true, he will realize that he has not eternal life, therefore there can be eternal life on no other principle. Now, if you don't know him, uh, and the ultimate destiny, as the prophet said here in, in the, the next page, is the first principle of the gospel, to know for a certainty the character of God, and to know that we may converse with him, as one man converses with another, see. And then as he talks about the nature of God, he says, for example, God himself was once as we are now, and as an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today, and the great God who holds this world in its orbit, and who upholds all worlds and all things by his power, 
was to make himself visible. I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form. Now, that's light. Uh, there's some similarities. We say that man, that, that God is anthropomorphic. The better approach would be that man is theomorphic in some small way, in the nature of his physical organism. He is like God. He is theomorphic. Not uh, that God is anthropomorph or that he's like us. Let's, let's reverse the picture and, and put it in the right perspective, see. He says, For Adam was created in the very fashion, image, and likeness of God. And uh, he speaks of it then in that sense, in that beautiful, in that beautiful clarification. Now, another occasion, he says, and this is the teachings, page 181, he says, There is no other God in heaven but that God who has flesh and bones. Now, that's a radical departure from the sectarian world. That just and from the whole world of Christendom. That's a radical departure, see. Uh, but while he has a body of flesh and bones, that body is much, much, much different than ours. By, by nature, by organism, by, by uh, the composition of the being, it's different than ours. God is what I call a physical hyphen spiritual being. Now, I don't mean that he's got a spirit body in a, in, in a physical body. I mean that the physical organism is physical spiritual. Do uh, you get the idea? The physical organism is physical spiritual. Uh, for example, if you if you turn to the scriptures and talk about the the uh, the resurrected uh, body, the character of the resurrected body, section eighty eight of the doctrine of covenants, the Lord says this verse twenty seven: For notwithstanding they die, speaking of the righteous, they shall rise again, a spiritual body. Now, it's not talking about a spirit body. There's a difference between the word spirit and spiritual. The spirit body is what we had a hundred years ago. I think that will take care of all of us, unless there's some translated beings in our midst. But uh, the spirit body is what we had a hundred years ago. The spiritual body is what we uh, will have in the resurrection. It will be physical, but, but it will be infused with the glory of God, which is intelligence, and which is his Holy Spirit. And it will be refined and purified and molded and brought up in its character and in its nature to the level of the Spirit. And that's why you have to sanctify yourself in preparation for that, see. There's a great task to do while you've got your physical body. You've got to do a preparatory task through the power of the Holy Spirit, so that when the fundamental elements are raised from the grave, then they can be acted upon, so that the physical becomes spiritual in all of its nature and character, and yet has the substantive basis. You see that? They'll rise again a spiritual body. Over here in, in the book of Alma, for example, uh, you have another uh, statement. Alma chapter 11, verse 45. Here's uh, Amulek talking, and he says, Now behold, I have spoken to you concerning the death of this mortal body and also concerning the resurrection of this mortal body. He says this uh, mortal body, I say that this mortal body is raised to an immortal body, that is, from death, even from the first death, unto life, that they can die no more. Uh, their spirits uniting with their bodies, never to be divided. There's, there's a fusion process that takes place there. There's, a, there's an, an integration, a, a synthesis, and a welding. Can I, uh, I, I can't quite find all the terms, but maybe all put together will help me. You see that? There's a fusion process there. And, uh, and so they're inseparably connected. And then the whole becomes spiritual and immortal. You see that? Now, uh, that's why I say that God has a body of flesh and bones, but it's not like we have, see. The scriptures speak of our, of our body as a corrupt body, 
It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown uh, in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It's sown a natural body. This is 1 Corinthians 15. And it's raised a spiritual body. And then Paul says, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. You see that? All right, now our Father in heaven then has a physical organism. It's flesh and bones. But uh, it is raised then, he having passed through the resurrection and made a spiritual body. And uh, that uh, when it's raised and elevated to the plane of the spiritual and when the fusion process takes place, and when the, the infusion of glory and power takes place, the fusion and the infusion are two different terms, see? The fusion is the welding, and then the infusion process takes place so that the glory then centers in it. Then the physical takes upon itself all the characteristics of spirit and power, and it's made a spiritual body. There's no blood in it. It is quickened by the life of the spirit. See, the spirit is, is intelligence and it's life and it's living power. It's vibrant. It's just, it's, yeah, and, and it's, it's filled with the attributes of deity. And, uh, and we just can't conceive of it. And, and you don't really conceive of it until you begin to taste the spirit of the Lord in your life a little bit, until you begin to move in your life up a little closer to the veil and maybe peek through a few times. See, then you begin to see what the whole ball game is about. And then you see how worthless mortality is. And not worthless in the sense that it doesn't have its value, but because it does have its value in experience. It has its value then in meeting challenges and has its value in growth and development. But uh, in real estate, it's worthless. In its nature, it's worthless. Without the atonement of Christ, it's, it's worthless, see. As the Book of Mormon prophet says, oh, how great is the nothingness of man, see. And he's not talking about, about us in the sense of, of, of our, our ultimate value, but unregenerated, unregenerated, and untransformed and unchanged and unin Christ. You see that? And how, how worthless we are, see. Well, God has a physical body, but it is a spiritual body. And uh, uh, this is true of all resurrected beings, if I can make that clarification, including sons of perdition, for a while. Let me add that one. You read section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It talks about the resurrection. And in the resurrection, uh, a lot of us misread that. I'm not say, I'll take that back. We don't misread it. We we apply it, and we only understand the application. But sometimes you can take a scripture, and you can apply it. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily what the scripture really, truly, honestly says. It's how you can use it. And, uh, and the, the use of it may be correct. But then you have to finally get down and say, now really, after all, what is it really saying? He's saying. Now, section 88, starting with verse 29, is one such scripture. He says, Ye who are quickened by a portion of the celestial glory shall then receive the same in the resurrection, even a fullness. Now, the application of that is this, and it's a true application, that if you get the gospel in your life prior to the resurrection, hopefully on this earth, and you're quickened by a portion of the celestial glory, and the Holy Spirit is a portion of that glory, you're quickened by it, you're transformed, you're changed, you enter into a newness of life. Then, in the resurrection, you'll get the fullness. Now, that's the application, and it's a true application. That's really not what the Scripture is talking about. Now, let me tell you what it's talking about. In the resurrection, as the Spirit is united with the body, it is quickened by a portion of the glory which it will receive at that time. And then you have to pass muster, if I can put it that way. Turn over to section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where it tells us, uh, I think it's verse 19 there, where you have to pass by the angels and the gods, see. And there's some preliminary passing by that's take, that takes place. You're going to have to pass by your bishops, maybe. Your state president, the living prophet, 
for this dispensation, you're going to have to pass by Joseph. And when they've all cleared you, said things are right for this, this person, then you'll finally go to Christ. And that's where you'll be endowed, by him personally, with the glory of God. You see that? All right, now, you're quickened by a portion of the celestial glory at resurrection. And then you receive the fullness. You see that? Now, that's what it's talking about. Then it goes on and says, And they who are quickened by a portion of the, celestial, of the terrestrial glory shall then, that is, in the resurrection, receive the same, even the fullness. And also they who are quickened by a portion of the telestial glory shall then receive the same, even the fullness. And then it talks about sons of perdition. And they who remain, after you get from the celestial to the terrestrial to the telestial, they who remain shall also be quickened. Now, who is he talking about? Sons of perdition. They shall also be quickened. Nevertheless, they shall return again. Now, they're quickened, and they're brought back into God's presence to be judged. And they have to be quickened in order to endure his presence. And they have to be quickened in order to satisfy the demands of justice. Because the demands of justice in the fall of Adam, Adam's fall, brought two deaths. It brought spiritual death and it brought physical death. And the first thing which we call spiritual death was really a death. It was a loss of life. It was a loss of the, of the divine nature which Adam had uh, as an organized being. He didn't have blood in his body before the fall. He was quickened by spirit. He was like Moses. He could look at the earth and see every particle of it. He could see the other end of things. He had those divine powers. He had priesthood dominion. He had life dominion, if I can put it that way, over the earth. And then when he partook of the forbidden fruit, all of that was pulled out. And he's reduced to the extreme, humble situation of, of worming his way around in mortality through the five senses. And we think that's great. And especially the academic world thinks that's great. But believe me, there, believe me, there's a sixth sense. There's a sixth realm of life, see. You can live in the flow of the Spirit. You can have the Spirit of the Lord teach you. You can feel its strength. You can feel its life. You can feel its power. And the great goal, then, is to learn this and eventually be glorified in it. You're not going to be glorified unless you've learned about it before. Be glorified in it as Christ has been glorified in the Father, see? All right, so... so Lucifer, not Lucifer, but sons of perdition, people like Cain and, and uh, uh, like William Law in this dispensation, uh, who became perdition, people of that nature in the resurrection will be quickened. Why? Because they never instituted the first spiritual death. That's, uh, it will be contrary to justice. Uh, for the Lord not to bring them back into his presence. They didn't, institute, they didn't institute, institute physical death, and so you don't have to worry about it. You're going to be resurrected unconditionally. You see that? Unconditionally. And similarly, you're going to be brought back into God's presence unconditionally. Now read, for example, the 14th chapter of, of, of Helaman, where uh, uh, Samuel the Lamanite talks about this. He's speaking of the atonement of Christ, and, and uh, here's one of those things that a lot of Latter-day Saints have to learn about, because we, we, if you were to ask a question in a gospel doctrine class, will uh, everyone be resurrected regardless whether they're wicked or righteous? And the answer would be yes, wouldn't it? There wouldn't be much, uh, much controversy. If you were to say, though, will everyone, wicked and righteous, perdition and the whole thing, be brought back into God's presence regardless of what they do, what would you get as an answer? You'd get his answer, no. And the answer is yes. That's the answer. Now, let me read it to you from the Scripture. Here he's speaking now, for example, of, of, uh, of Christ and his atonement. Verse 16, 
Yea, behold, this death brings to pass the resurrection. That's one thing it does. Get your spirit back in your body. And, now that's the second thing, redeemeth all mankind from the first death. Now, what's the first death? That's the withdrawal of glory. That's getting kicked out of God's presence, you see. Bringing with all mankind from the first death. And it's got a dash, and grammatically that means, let me say it over again, in, in, a, in a, the same thing in a little different way. Bringing with all mankind from the first death, dash that spiritual death. And then he explains, for all mankind, by the fall of Adam, being cut off from the presence of God, are considered, uh, are, or, are cut off from the presence of the Lord, are considered as dead, both as to things temporal and as to things spiritual. But behold, the resurrection of Christ redeemeth mankind. Now note this, how positive and emphatic and inclusive it is. Yea, even all mankind, and bringeth them back into the presence of God. Now, does that include sons of perdition? And the answer is yes. Unconditionally, yes. They're quickened. You see that? They're quickened. And uh, having been quickened, then they're brought to stand before, before God, and, and he says, Hey, I've brought you back to an equivalent position from which Adam fell. I've satisfied the demands of justice and decency and equity. I've done all of that. Now you stand on your own and be judged. You see that? And if they have come out in opposition against the Lord and committed the unpardonable and have lost the power of repentance and uh, are like divine campfires that have totally gone out so that there's no spark of repentance that can be kindled there, then on the day of judgment they die a second spiritual death. You see that? And for that second spiritual death there is no atonement. They're cast out again from God's presence. And that quickening power that is given to them in resurrection is pulled out. As the Lord says, nevertheless, they return again to their own place. You see that? All right. Uh, uh, this part, then, this, we're dealing with things that relate to the divine nature and various insights and aspects to it. Now, God is a glorified being. The glory of God is intelligence. That glory, then, uh, in its uh, constituent elements is truth and light. And it consists of all his divine attributes. If you read the, the book of Exodus, I think it's about Exodus 33, where, where Moses stands in the cleft of the rock, and uh, the Lord says, uh, uh, I'll, I'll let all my glory pass before you, but since you can't see it, you can't receive it all and endure it, I'm going to turn my back and go around this way, and you can see my back part, see. He says, and he says, Be, and I will, I will cause all of my goodness, and that's the word he used, all of my goodness to pass before you, see. And that goodness is a living thing. It's, it's living love. It's living power. It's living truth. Uh, and all of that adds up to what we call eternal life, see. Eternal life is the glory of God. It's, it's the life of God's glory, of his divine nature. Well, he's a glorified being. And uh, as the prophet Joe to put it this way, and, and this doesn't help too much, but at least uh, get you thinking in the right direction here in the teachings, page 367. He says, for example, God Almighty himself dwells in eternal fire. Now, we immediately shut that one off because he thinks he's talking about a visit in hell, and that's where he's dwelling. But that's not what he's talking about. You just turn the old sectarian concept of hell and heaven upside down, and you got the Mormon concept of heaven. Now, you just, that's, that's what you have to do. You see that? All right, God Almighty himself dwells in eternal fire. Flesh and blood cannot go there. For all corruption, the flesh and the blood particularly, is corrupt. For all corruption is devoured by the fire. And then he quotes the Apostle Paul, who's quoting from Deuteronomy, Our God is a consuming fire. When our flesh is quickened by the Spirit, there will be no blood in this tabernacle. Some dwell in higher glory than others. See, fire is equated with glory. He says, Immortality dwells in everlasting burnings. Now, you've got to, to get used to the idea that you're going to be comfortable dwelling in everlasting burnings. Uh, there's a difference, though, between the everlasting burnings that we're talking about there. Let me turn over to page 361 uh, for the prophet's clarification. There's a difference between 
the bonfire that we call hell and uh, the burnings that we call God's presence or his divine nature. The prophet puts it this way. He says, Some shall rise in the, to the everlasting burnings of God, for God dwells in everlasting burnings. And some shall rise to the damnation of their own filthiness, which is as exquisite a torment as the lake of fire and brimstone. Now, the burnings in relation to the place below has reference to the total inconsistency of the organized being with the, the true nature of life. It's to be totally out of tune with the Lord. It's to be in a state where his glory, his spirit, his quickening, strengthening, enlivening power is withdrawn, and where the heavens are brass over your head, and where there's the anguish and the pain and the, and the, and the trauma within, the darkness within. I once was teaching a class up in Idaho, and... Uh, Attending the class was a fellow who had been cut off from the church for adultery. And uh, he was feeling his way back and feeling the remorse that he was in. And there were times when he would go to the wall and just beat his head against the wall in order to divert the pain away from the heart soul pain that he felt within. Uh, and it, it, it was the only way he could get relief from, from the darkness and the trauma and the inner agony that he felt was literally to beat his head against the wall so that the shock would take the pain away from here and he would feel it up here and that would be a happy, a happy experience for him by comparison, see. Well, that kind of thing, see, is, uh, and that, that's the kind of thing that's happening with, with America too much today. That's the kind of thing that's happening. The spirit is withdrawing, and as a result of that withdrawal, there is a lack of peace. There's a lack of strength. There's a turning of liberty into license. There's a justification for license. And uh, like the Lord ends the book of, of Moses here with the, the earth was corrupt and so forth, and it was filled with violence. We're living in a violent civilization because the spirit has withdrawn largely in America. And we're placing emphasis on, on the forms of liberty rather than the essence of liberty, rather than the substance of liberty, rather than the true spirit of liberty, which is the spirit of Christ. You see, we're doing that, and we're falling apart at the seams and the more we spend on psychiatrists, the more the problems grow. And the more we hassle politically, the less really gets done, you see, in many ways. So we, we've got that dilemma. But uh, uh, God's glory, then, is the exact contrast. It, it's a living, brilliant thing. It's life. And uh, as section 93 says, the glory of God is intelligence. Now let me relate a few things more with you. Turn to, to chapter 1 of the book of Moses. This gives us an account of an experience of Moses when he was caught up to an exceedingly high mountain. It begins here in verse 1 by telling us, And he saw God face to face, and he talked with him, and the glory of God was upon Moses, therefore Moses could endure his presence. Now, Moses had to, to have an asbestos suit on him, if I can use that word, in order to abide, and the Lord supplied it. He acted upon him by his divine nature. He quickened him so that he can endure the experience of talking with the Lord. Now, that's, I mean, the Lord has to, has to really want that conversation, because he goes to great lengths to get it. You see that? He not only gets Moses up on a high mountain, and that's a feat of itself, but then he, he encompasses him with, with his glory in such a way that it becomes an asbestos suit so that Moses then can have an experience with him face to face. See? But we're that far down the tube. Now, we need to know that. See? We're that far down the tube. And it says, Therefore Moses could endure his presence. 
And God spake with Moses, saying, then he goes on to communicate things in relation to uh, that revelation. Now, let me turn to get the point over I want to make to verse 9. Then it says this, And the presence of God withdrew from Moses, that his glory was not upon Moses. Other times you have to should, and this is most of the time. You need to study the scriptures like a scientist studies, studies a scientific formula. Now, it's wonderful to listen to the tapes. It's wonderful to, to read the scriptures from beginning to end. I haven't done that very much. I don't think I've read the Book of Mormon more than three or four times in my life. I got my wife a Spanish edition of the Book of Mormon here two or four years ago, and she's read it at least seven or eight times. And the Book of Mormon itself, uh, close to 50 times in the last 15 years. Uh, I don't do that. I, I, I turn to her for some things because she's got the over picture. <laughs> the thing I do is study the scriptures like a scientist would study a, a formula and then go to the Lord and say, wow, you know, I'd like to know about that. You see? And you have to go to that over and over and over again. Now, here's one such case. Now, what is the relationship between the presence of the Lord, being in his presence, but to be in his presence as to be endowed with his glory, and there's a living, intelligent communication that is visual, that's intelligent, that is mind-to-mind, soul-to-soul, heart-to-heart. There's, there's that kind of thing where, where you, you see and you communicate. And it doesn't matter whether he's a million miles away. You're there, and he's there. You see that? Now, celestial life is quite different than this life. Moses looks at the earth and sees every particle of it. Go out to the beach someday, and just get yourself a handful of sand and start counting it. Start early in the morning on one handful, because it'll take you most of the day. You see that? Now, Moses saw every particle, and he saw it intelligently and individually by the powers of the Spirit. Jesus says, not so much even as a sparrow falls without the Father. Now, how can that be? Joseph Smith says that past, present, and future are and were with him one eternal now. Now, how can that be? See, God, uh, God isn't just a man. We happen to be formed in his image. We're his children. We're his children by, by spirit birth and by, geni- uh, by a generation we're, we're his children physically. You traced your your genealogy back far enough, you'd eventually go back to the man of holiness, and he'd be on your family group sheet. Now, you're a child of God in spirit birth, and you're a child of God in the origins of your flesh. We belong to the race of deity. We're in a fallen state, and we act like it, see. But, uh, but the great design is to give us that experience and to bring us up into his presence. And so the Spirit of the Lord then, the presence withdrew, that his glory was not upon Moses. And Moses was left unto himself, and as he was left to himself, he fell to the earth. And it came to pass that it was for the space of many hours before Moses could again receive his natural strength like unto man. Now, the experience of just being close to, to deity and partaking of that life just so sapped the energy out of him that that he just, he was just, he'd had it. You see that? And it goes on and says, and he says now, for this cause I know that man is nothing, which thing I had never supposed. See, now, you can picture Moses being raised as a prince in Egypt and probably educated at the finest universities and thought he knew quite a bit, and, and that's wonderful, but still having the humility and faith to stand in defense of, of the Israelites when he finally found out who he was and, and, uh, the integrity then that he had, but then when he has this experience and comes in contact directly with God, all of that fades away. You don't, you don't boast about what you know. What the Lord knows is so much more. You just don't boast. It's infinitesimal in comparison. The intelligence that he possesses. And he says, Thou for this cause, I know that man is nothing, which thing I had never supposed. But the point I want to get to then, uh, to show the relationship between his glory and his Holy Spirit. Here in verse 15, he has an encounter with the adversary, and we'll get to that a little later. Uh, 
in the program, but uh, Lucifer wants him to worship him. And then in verse 15, the record says, Blessed be the name of my God, for his spirit hath not altogether withdrawn from me. Or where is thy glory, for it is darkness unto me. Now, what had withdrawn from Moses as per verse 2? The glory of God was upon Moses. And then verse 9, the presence of the God withdrew, so that his glory is not upon Moses. What had withdrawn? Well, the divine nature, the glory. What does he say in verse 15 had withdrawn? The spirit withdrew. What's the relationship between glory and spirit then? They're synonymous, are they not? Now, over in section 67 of the Doctrine and Covenants, for example, uh, the Lord is talking about coming back into his presence. In verse 10, uh, he says, Verily I say unto you, that your privilege and the promise I give unto you that uh, have been ordained to this ministry, that inasmuch as you strip yourselves from jealousies and fears and humble yourselves before me, for ye are not sufficiently humble, the veil shall be rent, and you shall see me and know that I am. Now, that applies to us today, my brothers and sisters. You need to, to think about that. It applies. And he says, you'll see me and know that I am. And uh, uh, he says, not with the carnal, neither the natural mind, but with the spiritual. And then he explains, for no man has seen God at any time. And that includes Moses, doesn't it? No man has seen God at any time except quickened by the Spirit of God. Now, what was Moses quickened by? The glory of God. You see that? So when you... When you uh, see the term Spirit of God, know that the Spirit of God centers in his divine person as a glorified being. It emanates from his present, from his person and from his presence. It fills the immensity of space. It quickens and it gives life to all things. His glory dwells in all things. And, uh, uh, and this is, is, is his Holy Spirit. But there's a spectrum. There's from sunlight on up through. And how far... I don't know that there's an end up there. I personally don't think there is. Uh, in the refinement, then, of the powers of the Spirit. You see that? All right. Uh, now, when you have this understanding, then consider the relationship that exists between Christ and the Father. Christ is his only begotten Son. Christ is not just his Son in the flesh, but he's his Son in the divine nature. And uh, he's his son in other ways that we'll talk about a little later. But the relationship is such, then, that uh, there is a divine indwelling situation that exists. Let me suggest, for example, you, in your minds, I kind of view a circle up here. You just draw a circle around and, and let that circle represent the person that we call the man of holiness, the Father. And then over here, draw another circle, and let that circle represent Christ, the person of Christ, the individual of Christ, who is the only begotten Son of the Father. And then draw an arrow from here over to there to show the transfer of glory and power. This being over here started with something less than what he finally achieved, and he finally sanctified himself and finally developed himself and finally opened his soul. And that word open is important. Like President Benson says, how many times in the Book of Mormon do you read the word awake? Awake, awake. You see that? You've got to awake and get our feet off the ground and look up. Jesus awoke. You see that? And he opened his soul. And he met the challenge of discipline and of obedience and of refinement. The refiner's fire, the, the, the sanctification process, and that hurts at times. And he finally then brought himself to the point where the full divine nature of this being is transformed over here and centered in there. So that he has the full powers of the Father's glory in him. Now this uh, transfers to him then not only power, it transfers intelligence. Note how the prophet expresses it here in the fifth lecture on faith. It used to be published with the Doctrine and Covenants. 
He says, the Father and the Son possess the same mind, the same wisdom, glory, power, and fullness. Can you begin to see what he's saying there? Everything of intelligence, everything of mind, everything of soul, everything of feeling, everything of love, everything of truth that's here through the powers of the Holy Spirit, which is his divine nature. It's part of him. He's a glorified being, is extended over and centered in Christ and developed in Christ. Now, that, that's, that's a beautiful relationship. And the, the, fun, the fundamental feature of it, then, is truth. Intelligence is, is, is light and truth. And you're glorified in truth, see? Now, truth has uh, some unique traits and some unique qualities. Truth stands on its own. It doesn't need defense. It just needs to be seen and to heard, be heard. Uh, the more naked truth is, the more powerful it is. The less embellished it is, just see it in its raw nakedness, if I can see it, in that, if I can put it that way. And I don't mean to be crass. Just see it in its purity, see, in its purity in all of its dimensions. And it, it, it's independent. It stands on its own. It doesn't need support. And another feature of truth is that uh, it has the capability then naturally to bond, to have an affinity with other truth. And to do it on the basis that each is separate and independent. You see that? Here in section 88 of the Doctrine of Covenants, the Lord uh, makes this statement uh, uh, about his divine nature. Verse 40, he says, For intelligence cleaveth unto intelligence. Wisdom receiveth wisdom. Truth embraces truth. Virtue loveth virtue. Light cleaveth unto light. Mercy hath compassion on mercy, and claimeth her own. Justice continueth its course, and claimeth his, his own, see? And uh, on this basis, then, God is, is in and through all things. We'll get to that in a minute, see? But the point I want to make now is that when you transfer the full glory of the Father and centered in Christ, and it's truth, does it, does it uh, destroy Christ's will? Does it make him a puppet? And the answer is no. When Christ then submitted himself totally to the Father, does that mean that he was some kind of a puppet or some kind of a non-entity? And the answer is no. You see that? Because the very nature and character of truth, when the Father filled him with his truth, his light, his love, intelligence, true love is not possessive. When you have a mother who can't let go, and wants her kids tied to her apron strings, that's not true love. That's deficiency of character in the mother. You see that? True love, then, uh, is founded on truth. It's founded on truth, and it's independent, and it stands on its own, and it cleaves by natural character and nature to light qualities, virtue to virtue, truth to truth, light to light, intelligence to intelligence. You see that? And when Christ then received the fullness of the Father's glory, he had within him the same mind, the same glory, the same power of the Father. And in, in, in truth then, actually the Father now dwells two places. He dwells in his own physical being over here. And then his mind and glory and power, not in a possessive way though, not in a sense of subversion, but in the sense of the independence of truth dwells in Christ. And Christ then becomes what kind of a being? He's a dual being. He's the Father and the Son. He can be the perfect revelation of the Father because the Father is in him. You see that? And can be revealed through him. And so when Christ came to earth then, he actually revealed the Father. He actually revealed the Father, and you have a relationship of that nature. Now, I'm going to have to hurry on. I'm only half through here. 
Now, there's a relationship between the physical and the spiritual. That is uh, the divine nature and the corporeal nature, the corporeal, the physical. And uh, it's on this basis that the divine nature is dominant. It's a matter of mind over matter, if I can put it that way. The divine nature is dominant, and the, the, the corporeal is, is recessive. But the, 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 the corporeal is absolutely necessary. I want to get into that a little if we can. See, in order for glory to exist, it must in here, in matter. It must be in matter. Joseph Smith, for example, makes his statement. He talks about the matter, and he says, which is element in which dwells all the glory. I've learned that when you study the prophets' teachings, you need to hang on to it. He comes up with some of the darndest statements. Now, they don't mean anything until you find out what they mean. <laughs> And then you'll find a whole, just a whole flood of truth back of it, see? Just a whole flood of it. Well, here's one. Here's one. Uh, which is element in which dwells all the glory. Glory can't dwell in a vacuum. Charles W. Penrose, in a very classic discourse, in volume 26, as I remember, the Journal of Discourses, uh, talked about organisms. And the fact that God's glory has to inhere in and be part of an organism. And it has to be transferred from one organism to another. Now, the case of the Father and the Son is a good example. Christ didn't get the fullness as a spirit being. You can't, you can't give a, a spirit the fullness of the Father's glory. You have to have an organism that exists and that is refined and purified and that is open to the point that it can center in it. You see that? It's got to center in it. And so you've got to have an organism. And uh, when you talk about the relationship then, the divine nature is dominant and the, cor and the corporeal is recessive. But you have to have the corporeal and it's got to be refined and purified and welded to and infused with the glory and made spiritual. And when that's the case, then you can center the fullness of glory in it. And uh, things operate then on a, celestial, on a celestial plane. Now, let me turn to section 93, for example, and uh, read a statement here that may be, be helpful. He says, man is spirit, the elements are eternal, and spirit and element inseparably connected receive a fullness of joy. Uh, when that fullness of joy comes, let me, let me go on, verse 36, the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Now, know what it says, and light and truth forsake that evil one. Have you pondered on that enough? Light and truth forsake the evil one. That means, that means light and truth have agency. That means by the very nature and character of light and truth, they forsake, they act. They have the capability to act. And also that that action then is an action toward righteousness, toward, toward goodness, toward forsaking the evil. Now, when you unite the spirit with the body and the whole is refined and brought up to the spiritual plane and infused with glory, then light and truth forsake the evil one. It forsakes it and it gives it the capacity. It gives it strength because, because it gives it this, this decisive power of forsaking evil. You see that? And it gives it the basis, then, uh, to extend and exert its power, or the being. And so on that basis, then, God exerts his energy, his power to disseminate his truth, his life, his love throughout all his organized being. Do you see that? And he is in and through all things. Now, 
as we talk about, for example, the omnipresence of God, that is, that he's everywhere present. Let me give an example in the Pro Great Price. This is Moses chapter 7, uh, verse 41. <clears throat> Enoch has this experience, and it's just a brief but sacred uh, glimpse into it. It says, It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Enoch and told Enoch the doings of the children of men, wherefore Enoch knew and looked upon their wickedness and their misery and wept. And his soul, and he stretched forth his arms, and his heart swelled wide as eternity, and his bowels yearned, and all eternity shook. He was in tune with the infinite, and his emotion was transferred through the creations of God. You see that? All right, now, take that idea and uh, his experience in it, and... Take this idea that the divine nature or glory is literally in and through all things, the elements. The prophet says in section 93, verse 35, uh, the elements then are the tabernacle of God. Uh, it's not saying that God merely has a tabernacle of elements. The elements are the tabernacle of God. He's in and through all things. He's in and through this book. He's in and through me. He's in and through you. He's in and through the rocks. He's in and through the earth. The elements are the tabernacle of God. Latter-day Saints get accused of, of falsely, of saying that because God has a body of flesh and bones, that therefore he can't be omnipresent or omniscient or have all power. Because you're sitting on this side of the mountain and you don't know what's on the other side of the mountain. You see that? And so you're, you're deficient. But if you're a divine being and you've got glory, then what? That glory in, extends from you into and in through all things. And that glory is intelligence. And it reveals everything back to the Father. And he has the divine mind capable to perceive and sort it out and to understand it so that... Eternity is immediately visible to him at all times. So much so that not so much as a sparrow falls without his bread, without his knowledge. See? Now, he is everywhere present. He's everywhere present. And uh, it's like section 38 of the Doctrine and Covenant says here in, in verse 1 and 2. Uh, he begins, the Lord does, by saying, Thus saith the Lord your God, even Jesus Christ, the great I Am, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the same which looked upon the wide expanse of eternity and all the seraphic hosts of heaven before the world was, the same which knoweth all things, for all things are present before mine eyes. Now, can you begin to grasp that? Uh, take, for example, Moses' experience. Here in chapter 1 of the book of Moses, after he had seen the Lord and then had an encounter with the adversary, then uh, he came back into God's presence. Verse 31, the glory of the Lord is upon Moses, so that Moses stood in the presence of God. And uh, in this, uh, on this occasion, then, it says in verse 27, Moses cast his eyes and beheld the earth, yea, even all of it. And there was not a particle of it which he did not behold, discerning it by the Spirit of God. And he beheld also the inhabitants thereof, and there was not a soul which he beheld not. And he discerned them by the Spirit of God, and their numbers were great, even numberless, and so forth. See, it's the signs of the sea. Now, can you imagine being that kind of a person? See, we're so just used. We, we can see one thing at a time. We can think of one thing at a time. And uh, all that bears witness that we're fallen creatures. And when we see Moses then brought up and partaking now of the divine nature to a small degree, then we can begin to understand what the gospel is all about. It's designed to make us beings like God. You see that? Now, I need to rush on here and we'll just conclude in a minute. Uh, this is also the key to his, to his omnipotence. As I've said, it's the key to him being everywhere present. It's the key to him knowing all things. All things are present before his eyes. As Joseph Smith says, past, present, and future are and one with are and one with are and were one with him. Then uh, one eternal moment and so forth. See? 
uh, in section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, you have to kind of use some of these sections in the Doctrine and Covenants to, to make clear other things that, uh, that we find in other scriptures, including the Pearl of Great Christ. But uh, begin with verse 5, for example, as it talks about the glory of the church of the firstborn. He says, uh, even the glory of God, the holiness of all, through Jesus Christ his Son. He that ascended up on high is descended also below all things, in that he comprehended all things, and so forth. And that's part of the Gethsemane experience, that he might be in and through all things. The light of truth. And in verse 7, which truth shines? See, this, this truth that is the, the fundamental element of intelligence shines. And it's the, it's the radiance. And it says, which truth shines? As also he, Christ, is in the sun, and the light of the sun, and the power thereof by which it was made. As also he is in the moon, and the light of the moon, and the power thereof by which it was made and also the light of the stars, and the power by which they were made, and the earth also, and the power thereof, even the earth upon which you stand. Then he explains, and the light which shineth, speaking of this three-dimensional stuff by which we see, the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlighteneth your eyes. See, you see you see through the, the light of Christ. He's in you, and you are in him. And... The sunlight is part of his glory. And the whole thing, then, is one, one eternal fabric. It's, it's not just some accident like, uh, uh, like some people think, you know. Uh, the, great, uh, the great explosion, though, that, that created all things, supposedly, you know. Uh, it's, it, it's all a part of a great organism, the, the, of the eternity, with its various aspects and features and integral parts. And uh, the light then which shines, he says, which giveth you light, is through him who lighteneth your eyes, which is the same light that quickens your understanding. Which light proceeds forth from the presence of God to fill the imaginative space of the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God. See? Now that's the basis then of God being omnipotent. Now the great purpose of the gospel then, if I can conclude on this point, as we see it in the experience of, of Enoch, of Abraham, and Moses gives us an important key. And that is this, that the great purpose of the gospel is to make us like God. In the Pearl of Great Price, we have some sacred incidents recorded where people have tasted, been part of, and known by personal experience what God is all about. And what the plan of life is all about. And the upshot of the whole thing and the central focus and the basic point of the whole thing is that it's all designed to educate us, to give us truth and light and knowledge and understanding. And then with the exertion of our souls and the exertion of our wills, surrendering them in Christ and then growing up in Christ, you can eventually be a person like the Father and the Son were in the sacred grove. Now, that's the idea. And that's what the Savior meant when he says, this is life eternal, that they might know the, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Now, one final point. That's what eternal life is. There's a great vagueness among the Latter-day Saints of what eternal life is. Eternal life and eternal lives are intricately and inseparably related in many ways. But eternal life is the glory of the celestial kingdom. Eternal lives is the continuation of that glory by and through eternal increase. Eternal life is the glory of the celestial kingdom. Let me just conclude on this section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the uh, Lord, for example, giving the, the second comforter of promise to some of the early brethren, making their calling election sure says this, for instance, in verse 3, 4, For I send upon you another comforter, even upon you, my friends, that I may abide in your hearts, even the Holy Spirit of promise, which other comforter is the same which I promised to my disciples, as is recorded in the testimony of John. Now note the next verse. This comforter is the promise which I give unto you of eternal life. 
even the glory of the celestial kingdom. Now, what is eternal life? It's the glory of the celestial kingdom. How is that life? Well, it's living. God's glory is intelligence. It's life. It's truth. It's his attributes. It's his goodness. And to partake of that and be glorified with that, then is to have that kind of life that God has, which is eternal life. One final one now, chapter 6 of the book of Moses, where he talks about the rebirth program, and we'll come back to that a little later. The end result of the, of the rebirth program, of becoming new creatures in Christ, is that you might enjoy the words of eternal life, the last of verse 59, that you may enjoy the words of eternal life in this, in, in this world. And that's not the, this, the printed life. That's the living word that's printed on your heart by the power of the Spirit, see? You can enjoy the, the words of eternal life in this life and eternal life in the world to come, even immortal glory. Uh, what is eternal life? It's immortal glory. It's to come back into God's presence, partake of his divine nature, be made like him, be endowed with his glory. Open your soul, your mind, and learn so that he can endow you. It's like the computer age. Computer's a marvelous thing, but you've got to know what button to push. And glorification is a marvelous thing. It opens up what we call the celestial computer, the record of heaven. And all things of God can center in you, and it can be a, a revelatory. But you've got to learn to get your fingers on the right keys. And when you do, then it opens up the divine nature and you are filled with his glory and you are in actual reality as he is. You're glorified in, in Christ as Christ has been glorified in the Father. Now, can you grasp that? See, that's the idea of the knowledge of God. And all of that is a part of the great program of the holy order which extends into eternity, by which I bear you my sacred testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.